come back. Um, this is our final session of the ODI's 2023 Public Finance Conference. And my name is Serdar Yilmaz. I'm the new practice manager for public finance and procurement unit of the global governance global practice uh, of the World Bank. Um, before starting my remarks, I want to thank uh, ODI's development and public finance team, especially Frederick Dahan, who's going to be delivering the closing remarks after the session. I'm really pleased to share this session today because as we discuss on Monday with some of you, the bank is starting a new work program on reimagining public finances. And in that work, we are trying to update our 2000, uh, our 1998 public expenditure handbook, taking so many changes into consideration, especially the interaction between government systems, PFM systems, and other types of government systems, such as human resource management and sector systems as well. Of course, over the last two days, we discuss a lot about changes happening around the world, especially uh, the shocks and their long-term impact. What we are going to do in this session, hopefully we are going to take these things, changes into consideration and try to answer the following questions. Whether we need a new public finance agenda for, for the 21st century, and how will that agenda be different from the previous agenda and what needs to be changed? To help us answer these questions, I'm delighted to be joined by three speakers who are steeped in the world of public finance and bring different perspective to these issues. On the stage, I have Emily de Montchalin, who is experienced in the private sector, government, and international relations, brings a razor-sharp political economy lenses to our discussions. On my left, Mark Robinson, whom you heard yesterday, and many of you know him very well. He's an international consultant and author whose name is synonymous with public finance and public financial management. His analysis and evidence on government spending is both insightful and sobering. But first, we will hear from our chief economist at the World Bank, Indermit Gill, who is joining us online from Washington, D.C. Indermit has made major contributions in the field of development economics, including introducing the concept of middle income trap and spearheading the bank's influential 2009 World Development Report on Economic Geography. He is currently the Chief Economist of the World Bank Group and Senior Vice, Vice President for Development Economics Group. We are delighted he can join us today to provide insights from some of his and the bank's recent work on debt and debt sustainability, fiscal policy and poverty, and domestic revenue mobilization. Over to you, Indarmit. Thank you, Sardar. And I'm very sorry I'm not there to join you in person. I don't know if you can see me and hear me well. Uh, uh, OK, good. So I'm going to share my screen. And please tell me if you can still uh, see my screen and whether you can see my slides now. Can you? Yes. yes. You can? OK, I'm going to maximize them. Let's see if that works. Does that? No, it doesn't work. Does it work now? Uh, yes. Yes, it does. Okay. So I'm not going to show you all of the slides, but basically I'm going to be talking about three things. I'm going to be talking about poverty during the poly crisis generally, but I'll, I'll show you a few slides each on these three subjects. One is fiscal policy during the pandemic. The second one is public debt after the pandemic and before, uh, and then domestic resource mobilization. I don't know how much time I have, Sardar, but please stop me if you think I'm taking too long. I was planning to take about 10 minutes. Is that okay? That's perfect. You can go all the way to 12. Okay. Thank you, sir. All right. So the work that I'm going to show you is actually work-based uh, 
the, 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 the slides I'm going to show you is uh, um, based on work by economists at the World Bank and also some work that I did at Duke University before I joined the World Bank. So let me show you a few things about fiscal policy, uh, fiscal policy in poorer countries. So these slides are from our Poverty and Shared Prosperity Report that we finished a few months ago. And the second half of the report is really worth reading for those of you who have not seen it yet. Okay, so here are the main results that actually came from there. The first one was that that in terms of a backdrop, essentially poverty reduction has stalled essentially, right? Um, so 2020 was one of the worst years for poverty reduction as well as for inequality, right? The other thing that the report finds is that redistributive fiscal policy actually helps a lot, but but mainly in richer countries. It does not help in poorer countries, okay? Uh, the third thing is that as a result of that, it concludes that fiscal policy, uh, that fiscal policy in poorer countries should actually target growth, not redistribution, so that actually uh, they can actually get to a place where redistribution policies start to help. These are generally when they get to upper middle income and higher levels, right? So the, that's the, the, those are the main results of the poverty and shared prosperity report. And like I told you, I think it's an excellent report, especially the second half of the report. Okay. Now, so I'll just quickly show you a few things over here, which are are uh, which essentially have to do with uh, the uh, trends in poverty reduction. And as you sort of see, there was a big jump in poverty in 2020, and things haven't got. Uh, things haven't got better really quickly, just so you know, right? Okay, so then uh, let me go down. Uh, so it was also so here. Uh, uh, so here was how. Uh, so here was how much poverty actually changed between, uh, especially after 1990. If you sort of look at that, you see it essentially goes down pretty much in every year except 2020, where it actually goes up a lot, right? Uh, so uh, the same thing is true of global inequality, probably for the same reason. And then finally, if you sort of look at this, you, you find that low-income countries actually will, uh, so about, about, uh, about more than half of low-income countries actually had higher poverty in 2022 than they did in 2019. This was not the case in upper middle-income countries and lower middle-income countries, they did much better. Okay. Uh, and then, okay, so, so, so uh, the, what the report does is that it actually looks into uh, how effective was fiscal policy, right? So uh, the, 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 the uh, first obvious result is that high income countries actually had a, a lot more money to spend because they could borrow on good terms. Uh, so they spent an additional 10% of GDP essentially. Uh, they spent about two percent of this on health, and the rest on on oh, what, what what I call non-healthy measures. Okay, um, the, the, then if you look at upper middle-income countries, countries like China and others, they spent about five percent. Uh, they spent an additional five percent of GDP, and roughly the same amount of that oh, of about one point seven percent of this was on healthcare. Low middle income countries, as you sort of start to sort of see, they spend about 3% of GDP and um, they spend about 1% of this, 1% uh, of GDP extra on healthcare, right? So this is the total amount. Then if you look at the effects of this fiscal policy response on poverty, so if you look at uh, for high income countries, it actually fully offset the, uh, it fully offset the effects in upper middle income countries, it offset about half of the poverty effect. In lower middle income countries, that was about a quarter. And in uh, in lower middle income countries, about a quarter. And actually in low income countries, it was none of the impact, okay? So as you sort of see over here, the fiscal policy response, while of course it was bigger in high income countries, it also actually offset all of the poverty impact. And then if you go to the other extreme, which is low income countries, uh, a, a smaller fiscal, uh, a smaller fiscal policy response, but also a smaller, uh, a, a smaller impact on the, a smaller impact on poverty, and this is for this is essentially for very very uh, 
basic reasons. And the basic reasons are that uh, you have, uh, you, you, uh, the, that the, the uh, way that, the way that poorer countries uh, raise revenues tends to be much more regressive than the way high income countries raise revenues. And the way that they spend the revenues is much more regressive than high income countries spend their revenues. Okay. Um, so uh, uh, those are basically the main results of this. And what this report does is that I think we kind of knew all of this stuff. It just proves it rigorously. Okay. Uh, and then if you sort of go uh, uh, down to some of these things, you, you actually find that direct taxes actually do collect a higher percentage of income from high, from, from richer households and indirect taxes collect more from poorer households. And since poorer countries rely more on indirect taxes, uh, their taxes tend to be much more regressive. Uh, and, and the same thing is true on the spending side, okay? So I uh, so I guess in the interest of time, I'm not going to show you all of these slides. I can share them with all of the participants afterwards, right? Okay. But in general, the main conclusions that come from there is that there are these sort of three fiscal priorities. The first one is to reorient spending from general subsidies to targeted support. But you have to sort of actually recognize the limitations of this for poor countries and for poor countries, one should prioritize spending for long-term growth, even during times of acute economic crises. So you should not be reallocating spending from growth to redistribution, even during a crisis in these poorer countries, because it does not tend to help the poor. And then finally, one has to be careful about mobilizing additional taxes, because the way that these countries generally actually mobilize these taxes tends to be much more regressive. Okay? Uh, so um, I guess the bottom line is that the COVID-19 response in generally uh, was not appropriate. Poorer countries were encouraged by the World Bank, by people like Sardar, to copycat richer economies and um, deviations uh, from this were regarded by the development community as deviancy. Uh, so I was not at the World Bank at the time, so I do not share any of the blame for this. Uh, but I do sort of take some of the credit for this report in the sense that we actually do think that fiscal policy should be targeting growth, both in normal uh, times, I think, in poorer countries, right? And um, so I know that there's this obsession about transfers and so on. That's good in high-income countries. That's not bad in upper-middle-income countries. As you go further and further down the income scale, it, it becomes a poorer and poorer idea. Okay, so that's the first one. Now, the second one, I'm not going to show you too many slides on this one uh, because I have way too many slides on this and I didn't want to sort of, uh, so I didn't want to overburden you with this because we've been working a lot on debt in low income countries. And essentially, if you look at debt in low income countries, uh, the, 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 there are these three aspects of debt policy. The first one is debt transparency. The second one is debt sustainability. And the third one is debt restructuring, right? If you look at debt transparency, this is a serious problem in the sense that we generally don't know how much these countries actually owe. We do our best to actually get these numbers, uh, but this is made very difficult, both by new and old creditors. So generally speaking, China is blamed a lot for this in the sense that you have all of these sort of bilateral deals that China makes with, with, with low-income country governments and so on. And... Um, they have all of these non-disclosure clauses and so on, right? And the problem is, of course, is that this is not just for China. This is also the case for private creditors from richer countries. I'm talking about I'm talking about companies like Glencore and others. They all have confidentiality clauses, and it's very hard to actually find out how much the uh, how much the taxpayers of a country actually owe on the public debt because their governments are completely non-transparent about this. So that's the first part. So we actually did a major report on this. It's called Debt Transparency in Developing Countries. And it's available on the World Bank website. And it actually does a really good job about what actually does need to be done on this one. Uh, 
One of its recommendations is actually that um, the World Bank and the IMF actually join their books up completely. And so that, that when a country gets into trouble, the first fight shouldn't be about how much debt it actually owes. But in general, what we find is that when a country does get into debt trouble, we find out that actually the amounts of debt it has are much greater than we thought they did. Okay, So that's the first part. Uh, but here, I wouldn't blame the IMF and the World Bank at all, because I think that, uh, you know, we actually try a lot. And there are lots of hurdles in this one, both on the private side and also on the government side. The second problem is one of debt sustainability. And the World Bank and the IMF use something called the low-income country debt sustainability framework. And this framework is completely short. Okay, It's a terrible framework. It has lousy economics and it has really poor alignment with the SDGs. Um, it needs to be it needs to be gutted and replaced. And so, if you look at this paper that we are just going to put out, it's called "Making the Lake DSF Fit for Purpose." It's by Brian Pinto and me. And if you would like to see it, I can share that with you. But it should be up fairly soon. It's obviously going to be a very controversial paper because we are trying to. We're not uh, throwing uh, stones at others. We're throwing stones at ourselves. It hurts. Um, the the uh, third part, of course, is on debt restructuring. Uh, that's a really tricky problem. You get politics involved in this and so on. And uh, the problem, though, is that there is an absence of any functional framework. The closest thing to a framework that we have is called the G20 Common Framework, which I would say it's neither. It's neither common nor is it a framework. Uh, it's not common. I mean, you know, uh, four countries have applied for this out of an overall number that is closer to 70. So obviously just 5% of countries have actually applied to, 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 to this. Uh, and they apply. They don't apply to this for a very good reason. The first one is that debt relief from this is very, very slow. The second one is that it gets punished by ratings agencies and so on. Uh, and the third one, of course, is that actually the private sector does not want to participate in this. And that that's really a hangover from uh, something that was that was actually instituted um, during the pandemic where you actually had a debt suspension or debt service suspension, a DSSI, right? And Private sector, uh, so uh, what was the uh, main problem with that was that the, the that that private sector that private sector creditors did not participate in that. So as a result, the G20 Common Framework, which was built on that, actually was built on a very weak foundation. So it's really hard to get private sector thing. But the, there's this other problem. The other problem is kind of like the low income country debt sustainability framework. Uh, these debt restructuring, uh, you know, they actually they actually depend on an outdated Paris Club mechanism that was designed to engineer uh, uh, to engineer debt relief uh, owed by low income countries to high income country governments and banks, okay, not to middle income country governments and bondholders, okay. And there's another paper that we've written, which I've written with uh, two other people, uh, Mark Thomas and Kenan. Karakula, it's called Developing Country Debt, Breaking the Impasse. If you'd like to see it, I can share that with you too. Okay, so that's the that's the second problem in the sense that what happened was that the fiscal policy responses during the pandemic and the other uh, food and fuel price crises and so on have not really helped the poor that much in terms of fiscal policy responses, but they have hurt in terms of actually adding to the debt of these countries. And on top of that, what happened was that, of course, because of the increases in uh, because of the increases in the Fed interest rates, because of the flight of capital from low income and middle income countries to high income countries, and you know you've actually had a huge increase in the spreads that these countries now have to pay. So as a result of that. There is a huge drumbeat now that these countries ought to not depend on debt so much and they should raise their taxes much more. Uh, and so you have this debate on domestic resource mobilization. Everybody seems to be piling onto these countries. And it's worth actually seeing what, you know, what is 
what actually lies behind domestic resource mobilizations in low and middle income countries. So the first thing I would say is that it's become a slogan. It's not really a strategy uh, because uh, the people who advocate this do not distinguish between governments that are unable to raise revenues because of primitive economic structures of the economy or because they don't have administrative capacity from those who are unwilling to impose taxes on people who should be paying them, okay? And the thing is that it is difficult to do this, but it's not impossible. And actually there was a group of researchers at Duke University, uh, Graham Glende and others back in 2018 that I, who actually did this for all countries and actually found that you could distinguish between these two types of countries. The thing that they also found was that tax capacity actually pinches the most in lower middle income countries because foreign aid actually starts to fall fast and domestic resources don't grow uh, fast at all and developing and the spending needs increase rapidly. And these countries tend to sort of, uh, uh, the other countries that tend to sort of essentially fall behind. So it's during lower middle income that countries fall behind on this one. And then the third part, of course, is given the that you know you, you can actually help on the side of taxes and you can help on the side of expenditures, making expenditures more efficient and so on. But there's this middle category, which are tax expenditures. These are exemptions and so on. And these tend to be the most non-transparent and the most regressive part of public finance. So I'm just going to show you a couple of slides. So here is how much domestic revenues are as a percentage of GDP. And those blue dots that you see are the averages. So for, for essentially low income countries, the average is about 15%. But as you can see, the standard deviation is massive in the sense that some of these countries actually have less than 10% and others have closer to 25%, right? So you do get a fair amount of variation within this group of countries as well. Uh, the second part, of course, is even this doesn't tell you if a country can actually do it given its structure and so on. Uh, and that's the analysis that one uh, uh, that you can see. So here's the other chart that I was telling you about, which was uh, how much of an increase do you get in taxes and contributions as a country moves from low to lower middle? It's sizable, right? In the sense that it's almost 10 percentage points overall. But, but then if you sort of look at how much does it increase, uh, you know, during the stage of... Uh, during the lower middle income stage between about $1,000 per capita and 4,000, and you sort of see it actually falls by half, okay? It falls massively. So that's the stage that one needs to target. Uh, and you, you can actually start to sort of see what are the main constraints? Is it economic structure? Is, is it administrative capacity? Is it the availability of foreign assistance? Or is it the tax rate, right? Uh, so is it administrative capacity, is it economic structure, or is it the tax structure, right? And as you sort of see is that th these are not always the same in low, middle, and high income economies. Uh, and one last thing I want to just sort of say is that what we are trying to do now is that we are trying after about 25 years after the publication by the bank of the Public Expenditure Management Handbook, we've started to review, to rethink, and to update the approaches to public finance financial management reforms. And uh, so under Serdar and uh, Tim Williamson, we've started, uh, 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 started this new initiative that proposes a new approach essentially to manage, uh, to how to manage public resources, not for their own sake or not just for efficiency, but to promote development outcomes uh, during and despite the poly crisis, okay? And, and if you want to know more about this, you can either talk with Sevdar or Tim Williamson, right? I'm going to share these slides with you so all of you have them. Thank you very, very much. I'm sorry I talked very, very fast, uh, but I want you to get through all of this. Great, questions. thank you. Thank you, Indarmit, for a very rich presentation and thank you making it personal for me as well. Uh, <laughs> Um, will you be able to stay with us till the end for Q&A session? Great, great, thank you. Um, uh, so I'm going to skip a summary of uh, Intermit's uh, presentation so that I can go to speakers and we will have a good time for Q&A.
Our next speaker is uh, Amelie de Monchelin. Uh, Amelie is currently the ambassador and permanent representative of France to the OECD, a post she took up in 2022. She previously served as Minister for Ecological Transition and Territorial Co Cohesion, Minister of Public Transformation and Service, and as Secretary of State for European Affairs at the Minister of Europe and Foreign Affairs. Like in Dermit, her background is in economics, and she worked in the financial sector before entering into politics. We have asked Emily here to share her perspectives on how the international system needs to change if we are to address the big long-term challenges governments are now facing. Yeah, Michael thank you. Uh, thank you very much. It's my second time here at ODI, and I must say it's uh, always very enlightening and interesting also to see uh, external speakers throwing stones at themselves. I will try here not to throw stones at anyone, but maybe to reflect on uh, what has been also a, a big part of the uh, French uh, effort led by President Macron last year on this uh, summit on the new global financing pact, now called the uh, People and Planet Paris Pact, the 4P. And I, I wanted to reflect um, about that effort and, and your topic today. First of all, um, as the question is, do we need a new fiscal agenda? I think the question is yes. But to start, I was uh, willing maybe to see what is different from the fiscal agenda we need in developing countries and the fiscal agenda we need in developed countries. Um, as it was uh, extremely brilliantly uh, demonstrated, debt increased everywhere, but the level of deficit in developing countries today is the highest ever known because it's still higher than after 20 uh, the 2008 crisis uh, oecd computes an average of six percent of deficit in the developing world in 2009 it was four percent uh, and another number but it's very linked to what uh, indemid was saying we computed um, that uh, the um, support plans in developed countries were 700 times more larger uh, as a share of uh, inhabitant GDP than in developing countries. So the agenda could be you know, presented as we need a fiscal agenda which is new, but the case of developed and developing countries is different. What I found interesting that in many developed countries and mine for instance, many questions that are now putting on, put on the table are quite similar not in magnitude but in terms of reflection than things that are in some developing countries first spending will have to increase because in some parts of the world we have more youth to educate in other parts of the world we have more older people to take care of so the demographic aspect even though it's very different leads to the same outcome more spending needed the second thing which is common, and I was a bit surprised not to hear this in, in the midst, uh, words, the climate transition. We have developed countries which we need to get out of coal, the neighbor of France, Germany. We have developing countries that need to get out of coal, Indonesia, South Africa, India, China. So the green transition, even though the magnitude, the nature of spending is different, we know, but sometimes it's common, is leading everywhere to higher spending, public spending. And the third thing is security spending is increasing again everywhere for different reasons again, but everywhere the push for more security, for more defense is also increasing. So my first point was to say, okay, the fiscal agenda we need is a new agenda. And I think we have to be very cautious in the way we depict it to show that there is not one agenda for what is called the Global South and one agenda for call what, what is called the Global North. I think there are many commonalities, and I think that politically we should you know, also insist on these commonalities to show it's a global challenge and not a divisive challenge. That was my, my first point. My second point uh, is, and this is personal as a way to frame it, maybe my government will, no go, no, will not go that route um, nationally, I think we cannot imagine this new fiscal agenda for the 21st century without thinking about the private sector. And it seems a bit disruptive because so far when you talk about public finances, you only talk about treasury, taxes, fiscal spending of public actors. In France, we just published what we call our 
transition écologique, notre planification écologique, our ecological planning, and it's the outcome of a long process of how much should be paid by whom, how much is taken by state, meaning taxes with a redistributive impact, how much should be taken over by companies, how much should be taken over by households, and the sense we have, and I think it's shared all over the planet, we will not succeed in achieving our climate, our biodiversity, our development goals, if we keep thinking the public finance totally separate from what private actors are doing. How asset managers, asset owners, banks, companies, investors invest their money, our savings are invested, whatever the place we are on the planet. If we don't think in, in sync, we will waste money, we will waste time, and we will lose impact. And, and this is, I think, a new agenda in itself, because it, it was very seldomly presented as such. On this, just to have the amounts in mind, we have to multiply by 10 globally what we spend on what the so-called SDGs, and we have to multiply by 10 what we spend on climate. Today, the finance climate is known as being 1 billion. We know it's not, it's not covering all the thing, but we know that that number has to go to 1 trillion. And multiplying by 10, there is no parliament, not just here in London, but anywhere in the planet, where you know members of parliament will say, yes, just multiply ODA or multiply flows of uh, public financing by 10 and problems will be solved. It just doesn't exist. So therefore, we come to how to mobilize other resources from other actors to align them with what is needed for our societies and met public and private working in sync. The problem here is that we have very great plans. One is the Inflation Reduction Act, the other is the Green Deal, lots of plans in developed countries. But these plans are actually, because they are quite effective, working as massive vacuum cleaner of investment globally. So all the money that exists, all the savings which are liquid, all the extra savings we have, are being pulled very active, massively Two places, oh yes, the projects are probably great, but the way they are being coordinated internationally is probably not the best way to achieve the goals we have typically on climate. Because here we enter what I call the abating cost debate. The abating cost debate is a debate of effectiveness globally. If we have today $1,000 million, if we have 1,000 euros, if we have whatever 1,000, and if we decide rationally where to invest these millions to really reduce the CO2 we put on the atmosphere, we should put 95% outside OECD to get out of coal in India, in China, in South Africa, Indonesia, and elsewhere. And keep 5% for our electric cars, our solar panel in France, and whatsoever. Because we don't have a global carbon price, we're not doing it. So we are massively reducing the marginal effectiveness of our money, which as economists we are here, is a big and massive failure, a market failure, a rational failure, an economic failure. So in the recent years, a number of developed economies have created the famous JETPs, the Just Energy Transition Partnerships, to look at the places where we should massively put money to be effective in reducing CO2, for instance. But if you have JETPs on the end, Inflation Reduction Act, on the other hand, where is the consistency? We are not consistent. So the fiscal agenda, that's my second message, should not only align better public and private finance, but it should be consistent in the objective we pursue. If we are serious in getting out of coal, let's do not use a massive vacuum cleaner, as I say, to attract investment to places where, yes, the marginal euro is, is interesting, but is not the most effective globally. And this is a fiscal agenda that then cannot just be domestic, because if we keep thinking domestically, not only are we doing regressive tax expenditures, but we are also massively wasting our time and wasting our money. My last point, and I'm happy to take questions on this, is that maybe there are three topics I want to throw quickly, uh, where I think the frontiers of thinking are. One is trade and climate, and why do I link it to public finance? Trade tariffs have been a massive source of income for many countries for years. The more we do regional free trade agreements in sub-Saharan Africa, the less trade tariffs we give to countries, 
the more then we have to think on how we bring foreign currencies to this country and how we make these foreign currency flows consistent with our climate policies. And this is, I think, the, the, the interaction between trade policies, climate policies, fiscal, domestic and international policies is something I think we need people like you, think tanks, World Bank, probably OECD and others to, 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 to look. The second is on the tax agenda. I was also struck by the fact that uh, India did not go that route. We have pockets of resources everywhere on the planet and in developing countries that we need to raise everywhere. That is the OECD minimum global tax for multinational, is the digital tax, but it's also what we call now the agenda for global mobility. You have people now moving country every four months. They do not pay tax anywhere at all. You have now a new agenda also to look at real estate. We've seen that uh, when we were imposing sanctions on Russian real estate assets, well, we were unable to know in our own countries who were the last beneficiary of many of these beautiful uh, hotels particularly in Paris and elsewhere, because our system shared fiscal and tax data between of companies, for companies, for corporates, but very few exchange of data for high, very high income people. This is an equality, fairness, social justice agenda that we should push, not to increase taxes because we love taxes, but because it's a source of income that we are not tapping. And the last point is, if we want to align seriously private flows with public needs, we have again to go to the uh, nitty gritty, geeky financial regulation aspects. In the we're saying we need to focus on growth rather than redistribution. I would say we need to focus on green growth and not just growth by itself. But to focus on green growth, we have to make sure that the financial private flows are also green. Today, the green finance regulation is a finance regulation that brings again all the money to the developed economy. The green finance regulation today is preventing, preventing money to go to developing countries. And a lot lies into small lines of FSB, Basel, Solvency, to SEC, places where many of us do not go because we're not thinking this as being linked to public finance or to development. But if we don't touch this, I, I just give you an example. In the EU and here in the UK, if you are an insurance company, you invest in an infrastructure project, the capital charge in the equity of the infrastructure project is around 20% if the project is in OECD. It's 40% if it's outside OECD, black and white, for the same level of risk, for the same level of assessment. OECD counts in Colombia, but doesn't count Peru. We have Mexico, but we don't have Uruguay. So these things are basic changes we need because it means that the cost of capital for public and private actors in Uruguay is much higher than to Colombia, even though for many economic reasons, we don't see the difference. And maybe we would even do the reverse. This fiscal regulation, this financial regulation for me is essential to look at in more detail. And last point is credit rating agency. It was discussed as a debt, sovereign debt issue. It's also a major public finance issue. And then I will conclude. When G7 countries, the World Bank, MIGA, we do guarantees, we invest public money. And we expect that by bringing guarantees to blended finance schemes, we will lower the cost of capital for the private investors. Credit rating agencies today, they don't recognize the blended finance models. So whatever the guarantee you have from the public side, the level of risk assessed for the private part of the project is the same. So it means that we're not only losing effect of public finance money from developed countries, but we're also losing the impact locally on bringing investment to serve public needs in developing countries. So the FSB, the Financial Stability Board, has started to look at what they call the pro-cyclicality of credit rating agencies. And this is the question of sovereign debt. We are, France and others, working with Brazil and India to include a chapter in the G20 next year to look at one, 
Can we have a dialogue with credit rating agencies so as they include blended finance models in their thinking to maximize the impact of public dollars and euros along the planet? And this is something I, I really hope that you can help put, to push. And second is we need to go on the nitty gritty geeky part of financial regulation to make sure that our green agenda, our green finance agenda in developed countries, one is funded here, but does not lead to extremely arbitrary go no go decision for private sector. So with this, I hope I was both clear and hopefully calling you for action and support and happy to take questions. Great, thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Um, I would love to hear your views how we can achieve that international coordination given all everything happening in the globe. But um, I'll turn to Mark, that's going to take a long conversation. <laughs> and our final speaker is Mark Robinson, uh, as you've seen him yesterday. So he's taking the stage for a second time today. Um, for those of you who missed the session yesterday, Mark is an international consultant and author and one of the world's premier thinker on government spending and public financial management. His recent book, Bigger Government, the Future of Government Expansion and Advanced Economies, was described as meticulous and sobering by Martin Wolf of the Financial Times. Uh, Mark regularly consults for the government, governments, including on behalf of the IMF, World Bank, OECD, and other organizations. We are very delighted to have Mark here on the stage. Mark. Well, uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, Serdar, for that, uh, that great inv invitation, that introduction. Um, I've discussed a range of issues yesterday, and we've had I think a very rich discussion over these two days of the uh, of this ODI conference. We've talked about the challenges of public finance, and we've also talked quite a lot about public financial management. And the questions we've been asked to look at for this final session are, as have been read out, do we need a new public finance agenda for the 21st century? And if so, how is this different from the consensus uh, that followed the global financial crisis of uh, a bit more than a decade ago? So I, I think in answering these questions, we do have to distinguish between public finances broadly, by which I mean uh, fiscal policy, expenditure policy, revenue policy, and on the other hand, the technical instruments of public financial management. On the public finance front, uh, over these two days, we've talked a lot about the enormous spending pressures on government. Today in particular, we've talked about the uh, challenge of financing uh, the government part of the climate change, uh, the, uh, the transition that will be required to tackle the climate crisis. But of course, we're aware that the climate is not the only major spending pressure on government. I personally emphasized how much spending pressure on the health side there will be and already is facing governments over the coming decades. Uh, the argument I presented is that not only has this been a huge area of growing spending pressure on governments over past decades, but it will accelerate in coming decades. We talk a lot about demographics and we're aware that in aging societies, uh, not just pensions, but uh, aged care are major issues. But of course, uh, things like the pressure on health expenditure and naturally climate as well are not demographic relate, demographically related or primarily demographically related. And therefore they will operate not only in the aging rich world, but right across the planet. So those big spending pressures are very much uh, on our mind. The other thing that uh, people have kept on talking about in uh, various ways over these two days has been the need to build fiscal resilience, the capacity to face uh, 
uh, future crises. It's been emphasized what a black swan event the recent pandemic was, even though in some ways it was something that we all knew was, was, was coming. So this has really sort of highlighted the need to build fiscal resilience, as it's been put by a number of people. So um, on the public finance front, this tells us immediately that the context is very, very different from after the global financial crisis. You know, what's similar, of course, and what's even worse than after the GFC is that debt levels are even higher and that a larger number of countries around the world have uh, levels of debt which are already unsustainably high. And when you add this to the spending pressures, that this, uh, this, is, this creates very grave risks. So it seems to me that uh, the situation is very similar to post GFC in the sense that we need fiscal consolidation. The majority, not all countries, but the majority of countries around the world either need to reduce their debt levels, it'll have to be gradually, of course, uh, or they need to make sure they go no higher. It's only a minority of countries that aren't in that situation. So this is going to require fiscal consolidation. Of course, we have to emphasize the denominator side of the solution, pushing growth as much as possible. But in that context, it's rather frightening that, uh, and, and by the way, this is something I didn't think it's been mentioned at all in these last two days, there is a serious risk we are now on the brink of a major global recession. I mean, it seems to me in any event that with what's happening in China and the uh, longer continuation of higher interest rates than was expected, that it's, it's quite a major risk. And that's certainly not going to help. So if there's a lot of similarities with post GFC, what's the difference? Well, in my mind, the biggest difference is that I'm not sure whether you can call it a consensus, but after the GFC, there was a very widespread view that fiscal consolidation meant primarily consolidation on the expenditure side. And uh, it seems to me, uh, you know, that is in the sense that most of the all or most of the reduction in budget deficits had to be by the reduction of expenditure. Extreme versions of that, of course, being seen here in Britain with the brutal fiscal consolidation that uh, occurred under the Cameron-led coalition government. In my view, uh, that approach can in no way be applied to the coming situation. I don't think there's any way that fiscal consolidation can be wholly or primarily driven by aggregate expenditure cuts. Now, let me emphasize in saying that of course, I'm talking about structural spending here. I'm not talking about the need to uh, uh, re to uh, unwind the temporary, fully unwind the temporary pandemic-induced expenditure. That hasn't been completed yet. That clearly needs to be done. And I'm certainly not saying that we should take a lax view towards government expenditure, but I'm talking about what we can expect to achieve in terms of of pruning aggregate government expenditure. In my view, this is going to go up in most countries, not down. Now, it, it, of course, this means that uh, under these circumstances, we need to actually take a tougher approach to uh, pruning existing spending, to new spending proposals and so on. It doesn't mean a lax attitude. I rather like the way, way Andres uh, Belasco put it uh, earlier today. He talked about the need to be bold but tight-fisted under the, uh, the coming circumstance. Uh, uh, as I've already said, um, it seems to me that uh, the great challenge here is that in the majority of countries, this necessarily implies higher uh, taxes. Uh, higher taxes is, as we all know, politically very difficult. Uh, the talk about how we build the challenge of political economy challenge of building a new fiscal contract has been discussed. Uh, this is a major issue that I don't pretend, pretend to have any answers to, but certainly um, strengthening service delivery, client satisfaction, results focus in government, maybe even things such as, uh, and I know this is a very heterodox from an economic uh, doctrine, but even the idea of earmarking some expenditure. So, for example, uh, the idea that people understand that a certain amount of extra taxes goes towards funding a better health system. Uh, we've, uh, I'm not going to say much about debt, but of course there's all this discussion we've had today about new debt instruments for climate funding and all that sort of stuff. I just go back to the basics, and that is that 
if your debt is already too high, then you cannot afford to borrow more for any purposes. It doesn't help if we have a burning planet to add fiscal crises and more macroeconomic instability to it. So, you know, there's, uh, of course, uh, a lot of talk about financial engineering today. And of course, it's a great thing for developing countries which are in trouble to have uh, uh, debt uh, relief and more uh, concessional financing. But let's just be concrete about this. What matters is the net present value of the debt. And uh, if you're in fact uh, forgiving some debt and then giving more concessional debt, what you're in, in, in practice doing is giving a transfer. And we, I think, all agree that for heavily indebted low-income countries, the only way of financing the climate transition is, in fact, through transfers. And of course, you know, um, we all understand, and Amelie has, has really emphasised the difficulty of that, and that underlines the importance of governments not financing things that should be financed by the private sector and the division between the public and private sector. It's very, very important but we've got to be clear headed about the potential and the limitations of the role for debt. I thought, in fact, uh, our uh, colleague Arvind uh, Mayaram expressed this very clearly yesterday with particular attention to the, uh, to the Indian context. So let me just turn briefly to uh, the more boring area of technical public financial management tools. And of course, that's my field. So. Uh, and many of the rest of you, and uh, and I apologise for spending uh, as much time as I'm going to do on that. But it seems to me that when we look at the uh, the toolkit that's available for achieving these sorts of uh, dealing with the coming environment, uh, as I've emphasised, it seems to me a lot of the toolkit that's been developed over recent decades is the right toolkit. That doesn't mean it doesn't need tweaking. It doesn't need modification. Uh, there is certainly a need to go through the toolkit and, uh, I mean, Tim Williamson said that your project is very much about asking which of those tools are useful for the outcomes we're trying to achieve. And if we apply that test, I think we all know that there are some of the tools we're going to throw out. Um, that's a very worthwhile task. But in that toolkit, most of what we need or nearly all of what we need is already there. You know, a few examples, fiscal policy uh, and, uh, and, uh, and fiscal tools. The tools of fiscal setting fiscal targets, uh, fiscal rules are broadly the right ones. The idea that these should be principally anchored on debt objectives is the right one. People who suggest other approaches like net worth are sadly misguided. Of course, you know, there's a need to rethink the way we operationalize those uh, fiscal rules and targets. We heard uh, from Luc uh, Eho yesterday um, some creative thinking about the way in which the debt targets are set in an African context. So that sort of tweaking of the basic toolkit is very much uh, required. Similarly, uh, you know, there's been a huge amount of work, not just in the European Union, but elsewhere in the uh, development of the application of expenditure ceilings and expenditure rules. And that seems to me to be as valid or more valid now in the coming era than it has been in the past. As again, uh, Andres uh, emphasized, when you set an expenditure ceiling, you are forcing governments to prioritize. You're forcing the, uh, somebody who wants more money to suggest where that's actually going to come from. Now, uh, of course, you can't have expenditure ceilings that, uh, that are uh, not sensitive to the level of revenue. If government expenditure is going to go up, then the rule needs to be formulated in terms of expenditure was, which is permissible given the underlying revenue base, which is more or less what the European Union does and what is done in, in many other places. In terms of spending, the tools, the basic objective is to be you know, when we talk about being tight-fisted, to be much better at allocating limited resources to where they're going to be most useful. And again, the toolkit is there, but it needs to be applied better and it needs to be strengthened. It is firstly about new spending processes, about making sure that we limit new spending initiatives, whether they are in uh, public investment or whether they're in current expenditure, to things which are really going to add value to the community. And that includes whether even climate related investments. 
On the baseline expenditure, it means uh, continuing the work on spending a review, which is a systematic review of existing spending to identify savings. And, uh, you know, I'm a bit on record of the hobby horse about this, that unfortunately spending review, which is, you know, in my mind has always been about identifying savings. Unfortunately, the idea has been sort of watered down in some quarters to being, to being generally about uh, performance review and so on and so forth. It's not. What we need for the future is spending review, which helps us to identify as far as we can low priority, ineffective spending, which we can cut to make more room for high priority spending. We've talked uh, in the last couple of days about the need to uh, improve after the pandemic experience, our capacity to manage emergency spending. And another interesting point that has been made by a number of the colleagues here is the need also to be able to make sure that we don't allow the uh, emergency spending measures that are taken taken place to undermine our uh, routines of budgetary rigor. In other words, that we don't allow them to undermine the processes we have for rigorously reviewing spending, concentrating spending decisions under normal times in the budget process and this type of thing. Uh, finally, and I think I'm probably outstaying my, uh, my welcome time-wise, the issue of planning and budgeting has uh, popped up uh, repeatedly. Uh, we heard some discussion earlier today of the issue of whether planning should be separated from the Ministry of Finance. I think the, uh, the big question we ha have to ask there, and this is directly related to the question of allocating spending to where it is most effective, what do we mean by planning? You see, um, if we mean by planning uh, the idea of strategic think tanks can, which can provide information which can help governments uh, think where their spending should be directed, that's a great thing. They can be separate from the Ministry of Finance. The problem, though, is that in so many developing countries, it is still the case, as it was 50 years ago, that you have a planning model where the notion is that the National Development Plan is a blueprint for resource allocation right across the economy. It's almost like Soviet style planning or uh, forgive me, like French planning in the 1950s. <laughs> and the idea is that the plan should then set the uh, blueprint for the budget. And that is an idea which is unworkable. It leads to blueprint, uh, the blue sky planning, it needs to, leads to uh, disconnection between the plan and budget. And if you're going to have that sort of planning model, then part of solving it is in fact to make sure that planning and budgeting are brought together. Lots of other things we could talk about, but I want to finish with the final point is to acknowledge the point that many of you have made, and that is that technical tools aren't enough, that uh, all of this has to be connected to people issues, to political economy, and uh, I wish I had the solutions for that or the time to discuss it, but I will leave it there with thanks. Great, thank you, Mark. <laughs> According to the program, we are supposed to finish at five, and we are finishing at five. And of course, I made an accounting gimmick here. We don't have time for Q&A, so I'm going to extend Asking your permission, Frederick, extend another 10, 15 minutes for Q&A so that we can have a good discussion. Um, it's, it's, this session is a little bit like deja vu for me because we had the similar discussion in the very first session. So coming from there, I'm going to ask Indermit the first question. In the meantime, please think about your questions and let's ask questions. Um, in there, we were discussing yesterday in the very first session about the, um, I don't want to call that crisis, our colleagues across the street didn't like the word um, unsustainable, but many of the low income countries are overburdened by debt and the cost of rolling the debt is increasing. And as Mark said, there are, needs for resources for other things as well on health, education, in addition to climate change. And Amelie said we need to find resources for, for uh, developing countries to invest in climate change. We shouldn't be using the vacuum cleaner to suck all the money from the markets. And, and you talked about the that transparency, that sustainability, and that restructuring. Uh, 
in this environment, how are we going to provide relief to local income, uh, low income countries and and help them to invest better into urgent issues like climate as well as health and education? What are your views on that? So this is a difficult issue, Cesar, but, uh, you know, um, we should sort of go back a little bit in history and see what happened when you had the last major round of increases in interest rates in advanced economies led by the Fed, right? So the last time it was Paul Volcker who uh, raised rates and um, I think they raised rates by, uh, uh, so it took a while by the way for Paul Volcker to kill inflation in the United States about, I think about eight or nine years. So in that sense, I think one of the things to remember is that we are probably in the middle or we are at the start of this cycle of things. Now, if you go back at that time, you actually found that as uh, these interest rates went up, um, what happened was about two dozen countries went bankrupt, right? So, uh, so uh, those countries were those that had access to markets and they had borrowed on terms that they thought would remain the same. Um, these are countries mainly in Latin America at that time and in East Asia, countries like the Philippines and Mexico and others. Now, uh, so, you know, uh, we ended up having uh, uh, two or three attempts to actually help them. So first you had the Baker plan that didn't work. And then after that, you had the Brady plan that worked. But if you look at those plans, they tended to be A, market-based, B, they recognized that that it was the markets that actually decided what were the terms of debt that these countries would have, right? And then the third thing, of course, was this was not a country by country. I mean, I guess it was a country by country thing, but there was a general framework within the, the, that all countries, uh, the, 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 that was applied to all countries. Right now, we don't have that general framework at all. So as a result of it, a smaller country gets a lousier deal than a bigger country, okay? Uh, so in that sense, the countries that we care the most about right now are the smaller countries, the Zambias and the Chads and so on, right? And I think now the other thing that you sort of see here is that uh, so uh, what has happened right now is that I think all of the continent of Africa uh, probably also North Africa, is now locked out of bond markets completely. Uh, and then a whole lot of the other countries actually have massively increased spreads. I think spreads have essentially doubled over the last eight to 10 months or so for, for the other countries. So you either have no access or very expensive access, right? Now, under these circumstances, uh, we need to have a debt restructuring mechanism, which is relatively swift. Because what happens to a country once it gets into debt distress is very, very bad things happen to such countries. The first one, of course, is that you get a massive increase in the exchange rate, which is that you, you get a massive devaluation. The second one is growth comes to a halt because investment comes to a halt. In fact, you know, you, uh, you start to get a reversal in investment. The third thing that happens is that you, you get a spike in poverty. And then the fourth thing that happens, of course, is that these countries then get downgraded, not just in financial markets, but also in other markets. I mean, take the case of Zambia, for example. It used to be a middle-income country. It went back to being a low-income country. If you look at Sri Lanka, it was an upper-middle-income country. It's gone back to being a low-middle-income country now. So, you know, really, really bad things happen to these countries. And right now, we don't have, we don't have this mechanism. So the first thing that we have to sort of tell these countries is we shouldn't be telling them that they should be borrowing, uh, that they should be borrowing more from markets. Okay, and in that sense, said that we uh, we have been we have been irresponsible because we've told many of these countries that 60, 70 percent of debt to GDP ratios are okay. Well, they were okay because interest rates were low, but interest rates don't always stay low. So that's the first thing. The second thing that it cannot just be these governments that we discipline. Uh, 
We also have to make sure that, that private creditors take a loss because if they don't take a loss, if they don't take massive losses, they will do this again very, very quickly. They'll probably do this again anyway, but they will do this even in a more irresponsible way and much, much sooner unless they end up taking huge losses. Okay. And by the way, they were earning very high interest rates on this debt. So it's not as if they did not expect that, that these are risky bets. They knew that these were risky bets. So ex post, they should not be bailed out. And the problem is that the way that we structure, the way that we structure our deals and so on, there is a lot of pressure to bail, to bail out, to, to, to actually bail out the, 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 the private creditors. And by private creditors, I also include some of the private creditors from China. So these are the two things we, who, who, the, 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 these are the two things that we have to do, that, that we have to do right now. Great. Thank you. Um, I, I have more questions, but I think I'll be abusing my power. Uh, anybody from the room? Ah, um, um, Go ahead. So I just have one quick thing to add. You know, so I purposely didn't talk about climate. I purposely didn't talk about advanced economies and so on. It was not an oversight. It was because I wanted to talk about poverty during the poly crisis, and I wanted to focus on fiscal policy, public debt, and domestic resource mobilization. We tend not to talk about advanced economy policies because we don't have operations there, you know. But if you want to talk about French policies and so on, I'll be happy to talk with you. It will not be a pleasant conversation. But maybe we should take it offline. Okay. In that case, if I may, um, we are probably one place where what was said by Mark cannot apply. Our tax increase capacity is not existing. Maybe. That's true of Scandinavia, too, yeah. I think. Yeah. There was a hand from there. Yes, please. Thank you. My name is Leslie Dwight Mensah. I, I work with the Institute for Fiscal Studies in Ghana. My, my question goes to Indemit. Um, I come from a, a, a lower middle income country where the the, the, the revenue performance has, has stagnated in the last decade. Ghana was declared a, a middle-income economy in 2010. And in the last decade, um, the revenue to GDP ratio has improved by just 0 0.3 percentage points from 15.5 to 15.8% of GDP. And so Ghana seems to to be displaying the characteristics that, that reflect the evidence you showed of a, a tendency for reven the revenue effort to, to decelerate as a country attempts to transition from lower middle income to upper middle income. Therefore, the question I want to ask you is whether you, you, are, you are able to drill down the evidence you shared to sort of suggest to a lower middle income country, what would be an improved revenue strategy so that you know the revenue performance can be more rapid to match uh, rising spending needs? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, it's a bit late in the day for more bad news, but I did want to point out that in addition to several public finance crises that we face. We also face a massive democracy crisis. And we haven't mentioned that once in three days. Budgets are political after all. So we can't only talk to the technicalities. I, I think that in rethinking public finance, we need to think about how to spend and tax better. But we also need to talk, think about how do we talk to the public better and how do we hold governments accountable for that spending? So it's interesting to me that three days later, the word parliament hasn't been mentioned once. You mentioned parliament once as a, const as a constraint. I was a member As a parliament. constraint, right. Civil society hasn't been mentioned. Supreme ordered institutions haven't been mentioned. That's quite telling for our discussions as a, as, as a group of, of economists. So I, I'm not making this point to complain. I'm making this point to point out an opportunity. 
when the PFM handbook was developed 30 or so years ago, there weren't civil society organizations like Leslie's who had, were competent, who had skills to engage in these issues. Uh, we had a very conservative Supreme Audit Institution community. You have much more activist auditors now. You have stronger media, etc. And parliaments, well, I'm not sure where you, where you put parliaments. So it's just to, to make the point that if we're going to be thinking about public finance, we shouldn't lose the opportunity to think very hard about the impact of public finance on the much broader democracy crisis that we, that we face. Thank you. Um, yes. Thanks. Um, I, I guess this question is mostly for Emily. Um, uh, I thank you for bringing up the issue of non non domiciled uh, people. This actually happens a lot in our sector, in the development sector. Um, lots of people work in uh, other countries. Um, kind of live there, don't really live there, don't pay taxes anywhere. This is, oh, and they are being paid for from ODA. It's one of uh, the most hypocritical things in a very hypocritical uh, sector. Um, at the same time, I know people who have actually tried very hard to pay their taxes in these countries at great personal time and expense. So, you know, maybe this might be a good area to f start thinking about fixing it, but I, 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 the mechanism is kind of hard. Maybe there is an international mechanism where we can all pay our taxes. But what annoys me most about this issue is these consultants are effectively subsidized and, and they make the argument that aid would be more expensive if they had to pay taxes, but yet they're subsidized. We could hire a cheaper consultant. He might actually be better than you as well, you know? So, okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. We have one qu online question to Indermit. Indermit, there's a question about that sustainability analysis. It's a long question, but let me try to summarize for you. The, the, the person agrees with you on your criticism for DSA and asks whether if additional debt uh, uh, would be allowed even under conditions of high debt, uh, debt stress if the debt goes into growth and recovery and what do you think that uh, he's also or he or she is asking whether whether uh, dsa can be helpful not only for that for for also uh, fiscal strategies as well no one last question, and then we are going to close the session with Dominic's remarks. Yeah, thank you, Laura Abramovsky from ODI mm -hmm. here. I just have a, some comments for Indermeet. Um, so I was a bit um, surprised by your statement that lower income countries should not focus on um, poverty alleviation and redistribution and should only focus on growth. Uh, proposing a, a narrative uh, where growth and inequality and poverty reductions are opposite and, uh, and trade-off and the evidence actually doesn't show that this is the case. Uh, so I, uh, that's point one. In addition, generalization across income country groups saying that all lower income countries um, shouldn't, cannot do that because the, the impact over the crisis has been small. Um, doesn't mean that they shouldn't be doing it or they couldn't be doing it. Actually, we just heard today from Ethiopia, a country that has very low uh, income and has been very successful in addressing poverty and preventing families uh, from uh, not being able to feed their kids. And when you talk about growth and education and health and investing in, in the future, these kids uh, their well-being and their ability to go to school and to the hospital depends on their ability of their parents to have something to eat and to have mental health to care for these kids. So talking about or disassociating opportunity for these kids and growth from income today of parents is quite, um, I think it's, it's not very helpful. Um, and finally, uh, then there is new evidence actually one of the co-authors of this paper is from the research group at the world bank pierre bacas that shows that consumption taxes or indirect taxes in lower income countries with very large for informal vendors or markets are actually progressive because 
people from poor incomes uh, buy their um, their goods and services from informal vendors and has VAT is not regressive so just to to rectify that and think about it in how it varies across context thank you great good great in in, in there Mitt, uh, we can see your screen i'm not sure if you are sharing your sc screen on purpose but hold on I'm hold on <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> I am, I am, I am actually sharing it on purpose because I want to. Uh, so I want to actually first say that I was. So I did not. I didn't. I never said that uh, that poor countries shouldn't focus on poverty reduction. I said they should focus on poverty reduction. I just said fiscal policy is not a great fiscal policy is not a great instrument for redistribution during crises. Okay. So I think you didn't hear me well because I was very, very clear, okay? Or you wanted to hear something that uh, you, you expected me to say. I was not saying that at all. So I want to emphasize over and over again, this is, and this, by the way, this is not based on one paper. It's, it's based on uh, a whole series of papers. It's based on a lot of work done by the research group as well as the part of the bank where Cesar is from, right? So that's the first thing. Um, so what we are uh, really saying is that the way that these countries raise revenues tends to be regressive because of good reasons and bad. And then the second one is, of course, that the way that they spend this money also tends to be regressive. It doesn't mean that you can't make it more progressive. You can. What I'm saying is that you're fighting the odds when you do that, and perhaps, perhaps Ethiopia uh, uh, you know, perhaps that uh, you, I guess it could be that Ethiopia did rather well on this one and so on. Ethiopia would not be considered a successful case of fiscal management, by the way. Okay. E Ethiopia is in a debt crisis right now. Okay. Now, so that's the, uh, the, 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 that's the first thing. Ghana, really, really good question about Ghana. And I can actually send you the paper. If you write to me at igil at worldbank.org, I'll send you the paper that we actually did on the low income country debt sustainability framework, which actually has a lot on Ghana, by the way. It has a lot on Ghana, it has a lot on Zambia, and it has a lot on Ethiopia, actually. Okay, all three case studies. And we actually look at that. Now, I think one of the problems with Ghana was, and the weakness of the debt sustainability framework, is that it, it, does, not, it does not clearly look at two things. The first one is it does not, it does not centrally treat the fact that you have uh, that you have a large amount of domestic debt, because the LIC DSF framework tends to focus on external debt. Okay? The second one is, in general, its machinery tends to be geared towards external official debt. Okay? When actually, what is happening now is that Ghana has been accessing bonds, uh, so it has been accessing outside markets regularly. Okay. Ghana, what Ghana also wanted to do was Ghana also wanted to declare independence from the discipline of markets. It said actually it knew better than the markets about, about how much money it should be spending on what. Okay. So we've been engaged in discussions with Ghana and so on. They wanted to declare independence from markets at the same time that they were accessing markets. Okay. Now it turns out that Ghana has a whole lot of other things that happen in Ghana that masked this problem for a while. One of them, for example, was that Ghana rebased its GDP. So as a result of that, that went up a lot. And as a result of that, the debt to GDP ratio went down temporarily and Ghana got another reprieve. None of these things were factored into the way that the IMF and the World Bank did its, uh, did its debt sustainability analysis. And that debt sustainability analysis, when a country is accessing foreign markets, is actually a very important thing because it sends signals, not just to the borrower, it sends signals to the lenders as well. And if you give the lenders wrong signals, then you end up actually distorting markets as well. Okay? The, uh, so I don't think Ghana did very poorly on the revenue side, by the way. So I was just looking at the numbers that we computed in 2018. And Ghana is not great, uh, uh, so it's not great on the revenue effort, but it's not um, it, it's not in the worst category either. 
right? So of course it could do much better on the revenue side, but it wasn't the worst. So it was not on that side. It was much more on the expenditure side, I think. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll turn to uh, Emily. Okay. Just on, on global mobility, that's the code name. Um, the idea of some countries is not to focus on consultants for development. Uh, is to also look at uh, very high income people, uh, CEOs. There is a group, and it seems a bit marginal initially, but when you look in numbers, in fact, you have a lot of people who are not registered in any tax system. So the idea is to invent a global mechanism where you have to say in which country you pay your income tax. And, and this is not that difficult to do because when you work normally somebody knows about it and it can so the us knows to do it if you have a passport you have to register i'm not sure we all want to do and go in, on that system uh, but i i think it's a it's an oecd emerging <coughs> discussion that the g20 is also pushing as i said the real estate uh final beneficiary and france is pushing for so more um data exchange on people on uh, personal like the person physique uh, people after the whole phase of exchanging data on uh, tax information for corporates and, and and we think it's an agenda that honestly uh, is a good agenda globally uh, because we cannot you know a shocking thing still is that even though we have a global corporate tax now as a minimum we have one sector which was exempted which is shipping for reasons which we can discuss at length, but as we still have pockets, blind spots, and these pockets are not small. If you compare, you know, the income tax on the five largest shipping companies multiplied by 15% gives you a sum that can do things largely interesting for the loss and damage, largely interesting for topics which are discussed. So I think the global tax coordination agenda we not solve all the problems and and but there are still pockets where we, we should work and probably it the, the goal is also to level the to have a more level playing field on how countries react on this and also to give leverage to countries willing to go on that pace and that cannot because they are threatened all the time that if they do this people will move away so as we've done with the global minimum tax for corporations uh, yes, just two uh, comments. Firstly, the comment was made about uh, the populist threat and the de democratic crisis. I think in a way, uh, the good news is that the populist threat and the democratic crisis have been far less over past years than many people were predicting six or seven years ago. Uh, populism hasn't risen to the extent that many people predicted. And a lot of the populists, starting with the Prime Minister of Italy, and even Marine Le Pen, who apparently believes now in the European Union and the Euro, have been tamed to at least some extent. I'm actually considerably more worried about the potential impact of populism in the tough times that are ahead of us rather than what's happened so far. Um, uh, secondly, just taking up the point that Amélie made, um, what I said about uh, the composition of expenditure side reductions, uh, tax increases, was a sort of a, a broad brush. Uh, if you look at my book, I distinguish very clearly between categories of countries, and it's very, very clear that in countries like France and Denmark, there is no capacity to raise taxes further. I mean, in France, I think it's quite obvious that the only uh, possible uh, adjustment that makes sense is the sort of thing Sweden done, has done in the past, and that is major reductions in social transfer expenditure. But, you know, after the uh, in incredible uh, backlash that Macron has uh, experienced this year from what are really fairly tame pension reforms, these, this man is enormously courageous, I must say, in a country like France. I take my hat off to him. But, you know, uh, one despairs of the possibility of, uh, of adjustment in France. And, uh, Amélie, uh, maybe you have a more pessimistic, pessimistic, more optimistic view of that. But 
you know, uh, in, uh, by contrast, in the Anglo-Saxon countries and many other European countries, there is scope and the, really the only alternative is to raise taxes. But even there, it's incredibly politically difficult. And it's precisely for that reason that if you push me, I have to say I'm pretty pessimistic about our prospects of avoiding a new wave of fiscal irresponsibility with governments avoiding these hard decisions and allowing deficits and debts to grow even further. One second, if I may. Linked to the uh, political acceptability uh, in many countries of the agenda, uh, the social spending has to be effective for people to pay taxes. I think this is a big part of why many developing countries cannot increase taxes because the people paying taxes are not receiving the benefit from it. And this is why, and I finish here, these uh, global coordination mechanisms, including the high income countries, are ex essential. Because in the political acceptability of, okay, we have all of us to pay more taxes, the question is, are the very rich people actually also paying? So thus, the agenda we're pushing is not so much for France, but it's for the acceptability of the tax itself in France and elsewhere. And I think developing economies will also largely benefit if the middle class uh, in middle income countries understand that the very rich, maybe by international mechanisms rather than domestic mechanisms, are also taxed. I, I think you should come and talk to US politicians on the oh, taxation. Yeah. <laughs> at, at OECD, we have, uh, my neighbor is the US, not so far from my table, so. <laughs> All right, uh, I think we are abusing the patience of audience. I thank uh, our uh, panelists today. And I'll, I'll turn over to Dominic. Thank you very much. Three minutes, so. Um, I won't uh, bore you. We had already very much a conclusion, uh, conclusive sessions. I think that very quickly take away, first of all, poly crisis, yes, extreme uncertainty, and that's the new normal. Uh, so we're gonna have to get used to. We heard quite an interesting range of PT, the, the Minister of Finance, to give him all the power and capability. Um, I think there is a clear sense that the, the poly crisis has taught many lessons. The world is not the same as before, but the, the um, old lessons, mechanism, tools, approach remains very valid, capability, uh, service delivery, fiscal rules, all that remains uh, very, uh, very, very important. I think it was also really quite interesting to hear the, the point on digitalization, the potential, but also how that requires a new mindset um, and the, the big, big, big challenge, which is the flow of finances going in the right place where it's most needed and the trade off, which we, we've discussed now, which I think is a, is a big, big agenda. So that leaves uh, a really um, difficult, but also challenging and exciting agenda of research for everybody here. And we really look forward to continuing the discussion, the collaboration, the engagement. It's been a, a brilliant two days, uh, really stimulating, uh, as well as exhausting, I'm, I'm sure. So I want to bore you further. I want to thank a number of people with whom this event will never have um, been able to take place. First, the AV team. So Rob and David, thank you so much. They've been absolutely brilliant. Hospitality, Sergio, Alice, and Anna, who provided beautiful lunches. The DPF team, so um, Tom, Kahal, and Sir, that was really their brainchild. Congrats. And on operations, they are always behind the scene, but again, they make it everything uh, work very smoothly. And some of you have been in contact with them in terms of logistics. Maisie, Alex, Andrea, Ruby, but come in, come in, come in. I have to single out Laura and Yassin, please come in, uh, who have been working for months to make everything working very smoothly, the invitation, the visa, the hotel, um, so they, they really deserve. Let's give them a, another big, big, big clap. <laughs>